Hey guys, welcome back. This is our third video for uh, flowers and uh, fruits, and we are going to go ahead and wrap up the chapter with this one. So I'll try to be quick about it so that it doesn't take you all day. Uh, fruits. A fruit is a mature ovary of a plant. Um, a lot of things that we call vegetables are in fact fruits because they are mature ovaries. Um, for example, some that come to mind right away, squash, uh, that's uh, zucchini. Those are mature ovaries. They have seeds within the fruit. Those are fruits, not vegetables. Uh, tomato, that's a fruit, not a vegetable. It has seeds in it. Um, if it has seeds in it, it's probably a fruit because the ovary has ovules in it. So when it matures, the fruit has seed in it. Um, these often have accessory parts um, with the the fruit, you might still find sepals attached, like with strawberries, you know, those little green leaves. Those are the sepals from when the strawberry was a flower, and they're still there. Uh, the stem might still be attached, like in the squash and zucchini. There's an example of those. Sometimes the receptacle can grow very large, and a lot of the fruit can actually be the receptacle. And uh, these are going to enclose the seed, or many seeds. Some, like a pit or a cherry, will just have one seed. A pit in a cherry, rather. Um, a peach or a cherry will have one seed inside a pit, sorry. And uh, others, of course, like a watermelon, have hundreds and hundreds of seeds. So these guys are adapted for some specific dispersal vectors. Uh, some fruits, just because it's a fruit, does not mean it's something you want to buy at the grocery store and eat. Um, it just means it's a mature plant ovary. Some fruits are dispersed uh, by the wind, and the seeds are dispersed by the wind. Others are dispersed by water. And some, the ones that you and I are most interested in, are dispersed by animals. But even that doesn't necessarily mean that they're dispersed by animals because we're eating them. There are other ways that animals can disperse a fruit. So they're categorized by a few different things. Uh, fruit names are convoluted and uh, pretty crazy. Uh, the tissues of origin is one way we can categorize them. The composition, what the fruit is actually made up of or what flower parts makes it up. Uh, and whether it's a dry fruit or a fleshy fruit. Uh, most of the fruits that come to mind when you think fruit um, are fleshy fruits. So here's a couple examples of ways that fruits can develop in, in completely different ways. Uh, this is an orange cut in half. This is an apple cut in half. There's still the ripened ovary on the outside and there's still ovules which become seeds on the inside. Now the apple fruit that you and I eat, that's actually the enlarged receptacle of the flower that has grown around that apple. The inside papery stuff that you and I normally stop eating at that's the outermost wall of what used to be the carpels. Then there's ovaries inside of the carpels that we don't eat normally. Some people eat the middle of the apple. And uh, so technically, this is the fruit. Just that little hard part we don't eat, that's the ripened ovary. But the accessory part of the flower, the receptacle, that's the part of the fruit that we do eat, even though that's not 100% really technically fruit, because that's not the ripened ovary. Um, when you look at an orange, you have the seed that came from the ovule. The carpal wall actually extends all the way out. And that's the part of the orange that we eat is actually the carpal, the female reproductive structure. The ovary wall is making up the white fibrous stuff that we peel off the orange and also uh, the leathery skin of the orange is the ovary wall. So two very different designs for fruit. And those are just two of many, many different designs. So here's how we classify them. We can say... Is it a true fruit or is it an accessory fruit? If it's a true fruit, it's only the ovary wall, like what we saw with that orange. That was just the ovary wall and what was inside the ovary wall. The accessory fruit's got some other fancy stuff attached to it, like that apple. The apple had a big receptacle. And so there's other floral parts, like the receptacle can make up part of the fruit. Um, where did the fruit come from? If it's simple, then it just came from one flower. One flower, one fruit. It had one carpal or it had some carpels that were fused. There's also aggregate fruits, like raspberries. If you've ever picked a wild raspberry, it just kind of falls apart in your hand um, because a raspberry is not a berry. A raspberry is an aggregate fruit. And what we eat on the raspberry, all the little red circles, if you will, that fall apart, those are each individual fruits, each one. And so one flower is making an aggregate fruit but it has several unfused carpels, and those several carpels become several fruits. So a raspberry is a good example of that. I think a blackberry would probably also count. Uh, then there's a multiple fruit. A multiple fruit is individual flowers uh, that are all pollinated individually end up fusing, and so you get multiple fruits growing so close together that the fruits themselves have fused. 
So it looks like one big fruit, but that's not actually the case. It is many small fruits. Some other ways we can classify fruits is if they're dry or fleshy. Uh, dry fruits, think things like cockleburs, uh, things that we're not normally eating. Uh, if they're dehiscent, they are a dry fruit that splits. And when it splits on the seam, it'll do this with environmental conditions like temperature change or humidity. Sometimes it will split with so much force that it will actually kind of fling the seeds out away from the parent plant. And then there's indehiscent fruits, which is a dry fruit that does not split. And they usually just have one seed inside of those. So those are dry fruits, things that we're not really eating. Fleshy fruits are what we're eating. A droop is a fleshy fruit. It has one seed with a hard pit. So the cherry and the peach we talked about earlier. Then there's berries, which is a fleshy fruit, many seeds, and no pit. Not to confuse you, but a banana is a berry. That fits the definition of a berry. Now within berries, we can split them up into a couple different types. There's peepos, which is a berry that has a tough, thick outer rind like a watermelon and a cantaloupe. And then there's a Hesperidium, which is a leathery rind and partitioned sections. These are primarily going to be citrus fruits. Lemons, limes, uh, those kind of guys. They have oily, leathery skins on them. And so that's kind of your example of a Hesperidium. They have sections. You know, if you cut open a lime, there's like individual sections. Uh, and then there's a poem. A poem is a fleshy receptacle. And that receptacle tissue surrounds the core that has the seeds in it. The example of the poem is the apple that we just looked at. It had a big receptacle that grew out around those seeds. And so an apple is a good example of a poem. There are a few other ways to classify fruits, but the, this is enough. Like I said, it is a, a little bit of a confusing system. And so here's some true fruits. Uh, this is a cherry. It's a true fruit. It's a simple fruit. And it's a droop. One seed, one pit, one fruit, one flower. Simple, true, droop. Okay, uh, this is a pea pod. It's a true fruit, a simple fruit, and it's dehiscent. If you leave pea pods out in the yard and you don't pick them and eat them or pick them and, and shell them and get those peas out of there, they will dry out in the fall and they will split open down the seam on their own accord and drop those peas out for next year because the peas are, of course, next year's seeds for next year's pea plants. So there's a couple examples. Uh, this one is some accessory fruits. So not really the true fruits, but rather accessories. Uh, floral parts like petals are involved or sepals or stamens or receptacles, something like that. The strawberry is an aggregate fruit, which is this is not one fruit. It's hundreds and hundreds of fruits. And it's individually dry, indehiscent fruits. So this guy right here on the strawberry, that little yellow circle, that is actually the fruit. That, is this, that has the seed in it. That is a dry fruit. And then the rest of the strawberry is just for dispersal, just to bring an animal in uh, to eat that strawberry. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, the blackberry is an accessory fruit, and it's an aggregate of many small fleshy droops. So there are small pits in each of the blackberry um, fruits, I guess you could say. That's why blackberries are kind of, they have a little bit of crunchiness to them, I guess you could say, when you eat a blackberry. And then there's a pineapple, which is an accessory fruit, and it's multiple different fruits. That's a fruit, 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 that's a fruit. As they grow, they fuse together. And so the pineapple is actually many small berries, but when the berries fuse, you get this accessory fruit. So there's a few examples of some that aren't true fruits. Now here's some that you and I aren't eating, but are still fruits. Uh, wind dispersed fruits, like this has a wing, which is called a uh, samara. And it allows this seed to be carried by the fruit, which is this long extension of the ovary that's developed here. And the wind will carry that like a little helicopter. I'm sure you guys have played with these when you were kids. And the wind can carry that a very long ways from the mother plant where it can be planted somewhere nearby. Uh, this, of course, is the dandelion fluff where it has its little very lightweight umbrella-like structure. That's the fruit. Inside of here is the seed. And it will float along and uh, plant next year's dandelion. <coughs> Here's some water dispersed fruits. Uh, this is a sedge in, I think, Africa. It drops the seed. The fruit will float point down until it lands in a marsh and it'll grow next year's sedges. And this is a coconut fruit. And the coconut can float in the seawater for miles and miles and miles and then plant itself somewhere different. 
So there's some animal dispersed fruits. This, of course, is a cockleburr, and it has these little hooks. It will hook on, uh, you know, the fur of an animal, and then eventually be scraped off somewhere new, and it will have transplanted a seed uh, in that manner. Uh, and this one, of course, is the the standard, you know, berry, where uh, this is a wax wing. An animal eats it, and then flies off and defecates the seeds somewhere else, and then those seeds are planted somewhere else. So there's a lot of different ways that fruits and seeds can, can kind of get around. Uh, here's the dried dehiscent fruit. It's split open in the sun. There's little black seeds in here that'll be, uh, you know, blown away in the wind. Some of them have already been flipped out when it's split open, and it's planting next year's plants that way. So uh, once we have a seed dispersed, animal, wind, whatever, we get the seed dispersed, we get it in the ground. Uh, we have to break this period of dormancy because when seeds are first planted, there's a period of dormancy or a slowed metabolism, however you want to call it. They're, they're not growing. They're just waiting. And when we break that dormancy, it's called germination. And germination is, of course, the, the new plant growing out of the seed. So there's, there's specific patterns uh, that every plant uh, varies by every plant that are triggered uh, that the environment tells it it's time to go ahead and germinate. Some require a period of cold before they'll germinate to know that it's next year. Some will require uh, scarification or being you know, stepped on or cut or damaged in some way before they'll germinate. Some will require fire or smoke before they'll germinate. Uh, so there's just a really huge variety of things. Oxygen content, water content are the obvious ones that, that tell a seed now's a good time to grow. So after the seed decides it's time to germinate, the nutrition that's stored in that endosperm or in the cotyledons is going to support that new seedling's growth until it's tall enough to send out its own leaves and do its own photosynthesis and, and hopefully carve out a living for itself. And so here's kind of what your seed looks like. Uh, in this example, we've got a huge endosperm to feed this thing. We've got the tough seed coat so it can survive in the ground. We've got our little cotyledons. We've got what's called a coleoptile, so this is a monocot. This is a dicot because dicots do not have coleoptiles. So the coleoptile is basically the embryonic shoot, if you will. It's going to grow up like a little blade of grass, and then the rest of the embryo stem is going to grow up through that coleoptile. Uh, there's a plumule, which is the embryonic stem that's going to grow up. There is the radical, which is the embryonic root that is going to grow down. And then there's the hypocotyl, which is the portion of the stem beneath the cotyledons. As it grows up after germination, there will also be an epicotyl, or a portion of the stem above the cotyledons. So it's a, it's a wordy, wordy thing, naming seeds, but there you have it. So here's your monocot seed. If you've ever grown corn, it's very, very cool because the seed actually stays in the ground, which is just awesome. So the coleoptile comes up, that's our stem, and breaks through the ground, while the corn seed stays in the ground. And the coleoptile opens up, and the embryonic shoot grows up through the coleoptile to be our first photosynthetic leaf. Uh, the cotyledons stay in the ground. The food source is not drug up. Uh, the radical, or the embryonic root, is going to grow down into the soil. And so that's how a coleoptile protects that young shoot, because we don't want to damage these, uh, these meristems in that young shoot, or it's going to ruin the plant for the year. And so here's your corn grain. It's planted. Um, you water it. It becomes imbibed or swollen with water. The radical breaks out of there, grows down into a primary root. The coleoptile starts to grow upward just a little, and it opens a channel to the surface, and it stops growing as soon as it gets out of the surface. The plumule grows up into the coleoptile, and then up and becomes a true leaf, and that cotyledon stays in the ground, and they just keep growing more roots, they grow more leaves, and up, 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 up she goes. Corn is uh, very closely related to a grass, it's monocot, and uh, it grows like grasses grow. Now this one's a dicot, whole different animal. Uh, you water it, the seed becomes imbibed with water, it splits, and the seed starts to germinate, but this time what's going to grow out first is the radical or the root, and the root's going to grow down. And the hypocotyl, or the portion of the stem beneath the cotyledon, is going to grow out kind of in the shape of a hook, and it's just going to push its way through the soil, still shaped like a hook, and it's going to start to sense sunlight. And plants grow to the sunlight by pushing a hormone called auxin to the other side of the stem, which makes it grow longer. And so that hook ends up dragging the seed and the cotyledons above the ground. 
in corn, the cotyledons stayed in the ground, but here the cotyledons actually drug out of the ground. And uh, so now our cotyledons are up. They can sometimes be a little bit photosynthetic, and our primary leaves emerge that truly look like the leaves of a bean, and then up, up, up it grows, and it's got a pretty good root system at that point in the game. So um, flowers provide us the benefit of sexual reproduction, which provides us the benefit of genetic diversity, which in changing environments is awesome. But a lot of plants can reproduce with asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction allows plants to rapidly produce genetically identical offspring. If you're not in an area where you can make a flower and successfully undergo sexual reproduction and there's nobody else around, maybe you can use asexual reproduction and just take over that area with clones. That can work. There are several ways to do this. Um, one of them is called vegetative propagation or vegetative reproduction. And that's a form of asexual reproduction where you grow new roots and shoots from the parent plant or pieces of the plant. Uh, some plants, like uh, potatoes, they make the tubers, and the tubers make brand new potato plants that are exactly genetically identical to the parent. Um, other plants can drop little leaflets, which are identical to the parent plant. Uh, there's lots of ways to vegetatively propagate. Uh, there's also tissue culture propagation. Now this one's not the plant in the wild doing this. This is us doing this. We take tissues into the lab. We take a little bit of meristematic tissue and we put some in the dark, some in the light. We try to get some of them to become roots and some of them to become shoots. And we can grow plants that are very difficult to domesticate. For example, orchids, they're very difficult to domesticate because they're epiphytes. They, they're pretty picky about their environment. Uh, but they're worth like 50 bucks a pop at Safeway. So if we can figure out how to grow them in the lab, we can make a lot of money off of them. So we grow them in a tissue culture. And so here you have tiny new plants on this uh, plant called the Mother of Thousands. And uh, these little plants form along the margin of the leaf. And then when they're big enough or an animal brushes up against the leaf, they can drop down to the ground, put their own roots down, and you have clones of this plant. So that's that's one way to vegetatively propagate. Here's the new roots and shoots growing out of a potato eye. They're all identical to the parent plant, uh, but that works out for vegetative propagation. And one really cool example of vegetative propagation is grafting. Um, apples are super tricky because most of the apples you grow from seeds you can't eat. They're, they're completely unpalatable. Um, but you can take a good apple that you know is edible and you can graft that branch onto an existing apple tree. And if the graft takes, it will support that branch, and that branch will grow good apples. And so domesticated apple varieties are grafted to try to produce the traits that we value, like color, flavor, size, sweetness, and texture. And this guy they called you know, Johnny Appleseed, who was a real guy, he planted a bunch of apples all over the place, a bunch of apple trees, and uh, then would sell the land to settlers, you know, by telling them that there were apple trees on the land. And he planted them all from seed. And so when the settlers would get there, they would find that, of course, the apples were, by and large, disgusting and inedible. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I guess on a, on a good note, that's how we ended up making apple cider. So that's cool. Um, on a bad note, they, uh, they weren't able to eat a lot of the apples. So what we ended up doing was just taking the few variety out of the thousands and thousands that he planted. We took the few that were actually edible. And the plants that we have today that produce our apples for food, those are uh, all varieties, graphs of a graph of a graph of a graph of the originals that that Johnny Appleseed guy planted on the East Coast. So that was, that's kind of a cool deal. Uh, these are all naturally occurring varieties of apples. Um, that we would see if you planted them from seed. So uh, that's your chapter. Uh, what's the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? Hopefully you know that at this point. Uh, why do we use the term fruits when we're talking about tomatoes and uh, green beans? Whether or not a tomato is actually a vegetable or a fruit went to uh, a court case, actually. Uh, of what adaptive value is the sweet smell produced by most fruits? And there's a couple of questions that you should be able to answer. And uh, with that, we are done with our chapter. So thank you for your time.